Well, thank you. That worship was talking about God get, being with us at all times and never leading us and uh, never leaving us and always standing beside us, which we're in a series called Back to the Basics. And the idea that we have for Back to the Basics is we're talking about simple Bible stories, Bible stories that you have grown up with, that you have told your kids, your kids already know. But it's the Bible stories that have to have application to our life in order for us to understand what it's talking about. And today we're talking about three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it's found in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3 is a very unique passage because we all can put ourselves in this passage. We can all be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in areas of our life. And so in order for the sermon today to take proper application, we need to see, could we do what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? And if we can do that, God would look and he could do some great things within our life. Well, the first question I have to ask is, do you have one of these two principles? Do you serve and do you live your life under external pressure or do you live your life by internal principle? Do, do, does things on the outside, problems, people, circumstances, do they pressure you into acting and doing and being a certain way? If external pressures changes your heart and your core convictions, then you are never going to be able to stand in the face of what God wants you to do. But if you have an internal principle, you have the convictions within your soul, you know what God wants, and you will not fail in the face of adversity, then the internal principle will be what you have. So when everybody else is falling apart and everybody else quits and everybody else bows, if you have internal principle, I won't bow. I will not fail and I will not falter when I have to bow to an idol, whatever that idol will be in our modern day. But these three men, these men had the internal principle to stand in the face of the king, at the face of death. How did they get that? You know, it's not something you wake up with and say, you know what, I think I'm going to, if, 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 if I have to die today, I, I, I'm just going to stand up for God. You don't, we don't just wake up and have that internal principle. That internal principle within our life has to be something that is brought up within our life. So we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel just down the road in a few more chapters. We say, how did they, how did they get that? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23, there is a king by the name of Josiah. And King Josiah came to ring at, when he was eight years old. When he was eight years old, he became king. And at that time, the word of God, the Bible, was almost non-existent. They didn't even know where it was. So the king said to his magistrates, hey guys, why don't we go over and clean out the temple? We're needing some resources, so let's go look at the temple, and let's, let's take all the monies out of the temple, and let's just clean the temple up a little bit. So they went in to try to clean out the temple. And all of a sudden, one of the men that were cleaning the temple, underneath the counter, found a manuscript, a book. He blew it off and looked at it, and he started reading it. He goes, this is important. So they took the manuscript back to the king. And the king started reading it and started, man, this is, this is like no book I've ever read before. So out of some investigation, they found out that the book that they had found was the very words of God, was the very Old Testament manuscripts. And Josiah, when he was reading the words of God, his heart became kindled. He understood this is the very words of God. And he became on fire for God. His kingdom changed. There was a revival. All because the Bible was found. It was hidden away. It was quiet. But now God's word is alive. And the entire country became under a revival because the word of God spoke to them. In that, all the young men growing up, all the young men and young women growing up, they had the principles of God's word, the principles that they're supposed to live their life by. 
And that principle is found in Exodus chapter 20. The principles that they stood and they said, this is God's principle. If you stand on these principles, you will never fail God. These guys had a passion for God. They understood what their king said. They understood that we are going to have a revival in our land because God is now found. His word of God is now alive. So all the way back in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were grown up. And this is the thing that has been grounded within their heart, within their life, is found in Exodus chapter 20, and you know it as the Ten Commandments. But let's listen to what it says. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make of yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children uh, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me or despise me, or do not love me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. That was ingrained within their life. That is what they knew. They knew one of the biggest things, there are no other gods above the holy God of Israel. He blesses us. He takes care of us. He's given us peace, and he's given us wealth. He's given us happiness. There is no other God. And then the very second thing is, I'm a jealous God. Do not bow down to any other gods, to any graven image. Do not, because if you do, there will be up to your second and your third generation. But if you love me and keep my commandments, I will give you mercy upon thousands. That has been ingrained within their life. That's what they know. It's from a child they understood God, they understood God's word, and they understood that if I'm going to honor God, I cannot break his commandments. All the way back in Daniel chapter 1, they never wanted to defile themselves. They didn't want to do what King Nebuchadnezzar asked them to do with food. They said, no, I'm not going to do that. And it comes to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3 is a very unique chapter because it comes right after Daniel gave a vision. His, well, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he didn't understand his dream. He didn't even know what his dream was. And all of, all of his magistrates, all of his high priests, all of his, all of his um, wise men of the country came to King Nebuchadnezzar, and King Nebuchadnezzar said, I want you to tell me what I dreamed. I want you to not only tell me what I dreamed, I want you to tell me what the dream meant. We can't. Only gods could tell you what you dreamed. So they couldn't do it. But Daniel came to him and said, I could tell you what you dreamed. So he said, I'd like to hear. So Daniel went to his place of residence. He opened up his door and he prayed to God. And he said, God, please reveal unto me the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar has had. And if you can reveal the dream to me that King Nebuchadnezzar had, I am going to glorify you. I'm going to lift your name up. And because he asked God, God revealed to him the very dream and the interpretation of that dream. And the dream was, there's going to be a statue, and that statue is going to be built up. And King Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of that statue, and, and it's a made of a gold statue. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful statue, except for underneath it represents five different countries. And each one is less severe than the other. And on the bottom, the statue is made of, of clay. And out of the rock, hewn with God's hand, is a stone that is cast at that statue. And it hits the base of that statue. And the statue is broken, fallen across the face of the earth. And Daniel said, let me tell you what it means. That means your kingdom will not last. God's kingdom, God's rock, will cover the entire earth. And King Nebuchadnezzar at that time said, wow, only God could reveal this to you. Only God could tell you what I dreamed. That's exactly what I dreamed. 
So it automatically goes into chapter 3. It's so unique that after God reveals that to him in chapter 2, he then, in chapter 3, builds a 90-foot-tall statue with golden image uh, overlaid with gold. And he asked everybody in his entire kingdom to come to the, to, to the plains of Dura and to bow down when you hear the music. He had the kings and the governors and the magistrates and the sheriffs and every person in any high authority come down and look at the statue. And when the music is played, everybody needs to bow down and worship this image. There are about 75 young men that came from Jerusalem to Babylon with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel. These men were in the custom. They were in the college of Babylon. They were very intelligent. They knew everything, what they were trying to be taught and their customs of the day. The music is played. Everybody, everybody bows down in the entire kingdom except for three Jewish young men. The Chaldeans, they said, they said, King, those three Jewish boys that are in captivity that you put in rule over us, they did not bow. King Nebuchadnezzar got angered. He said, what do you mean they didn't bow? Do they not know that if they do not bow, that fiery furnace is going to be heated up and they're going to be cast into the fiery furnace? Go get them. So the, Ch the Chaldeans brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the king. And he said, Ben, is it true that you did not bow down to me? And they said, O oh, king, O oh, king, yes, it's true. It is true. We did not bow to you. And he, the king says, let me tell you what, I'm going to give you a second chance. I want to let you know What's going to take place? If you do not bow to that statue, that furnace is going to get seven times hotter, and I'm going to throw you in, and you're going to be burnt up. What do you say about that? What do you think about that? And this is what he said. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you to this matter. If that is the case... Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. I love that part. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. We won't do it. I have an internal principle that I know what... Exodus chapter 20 said, and I have no other God except for the God of Israel. And I will not serve you as a God, I will not serve your God, and I will not bow down to this image that you want me to worship. These knees only bow to God. And in our life, what we do is we have one or two different areas. We either have faulty faith or we have real faith. Here's what faulty faith is. I'll trust God if he delivers me. I'll trust God if he gives me this. I'll trust God if I can see something happen. And that's faulty faith. That's sight faith. That is not real, genuine, from the heart faith. Real faith is this. Even if I die, even if I'm persecuted, even if I'm laughed at, even if I'm ridiculed, I will trust God. Even if I think everything's falling apart, even if I think my life as I know it has no existence, I will trust God. If we have that type of faith, God can do great things through us. We will not bow. When they said that, Nebuchadnezzar got mad. I mean, if I can say the word, he got chapped. His face became angry. He was so livid that how could these boys that I rescued from the, from, the, from the prisons, basically, and cast and put them over some of my kingdom, how could they defy me? They owe me. 
They owe me because what I have done for them, well, they should just bow down. I'll even, I gave them two chances. They should bow down, and they wouldn't do it. I don't like them, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to throw them in the hottest flame, burn it seven times hotter, and I guarantee you they will burn to death just like that. Just like that. He even said this. What God, what God is going to deliver you from me? Who do you have? Who's on your side? Do you not know who I am? I am King Nebuchadnezzar. I have this palace. I have this kingdom. There is no greater entity than me. Bow down or die. And they said, I will not bow. Everybody else did but I would not. So you know the story. He got mad seven times hotter. He took the mightiest men that he had in his army and he threw them into this fiery furnace. He threw them into the fiery furnace so much that the mighty men died putting them in the flames. They bound them with their hands and their feet and they had all their clothes on. They were there to worship, and they were there as magistrates. They were totally clothed, totally dressed up. They were having their suit and ties on. They were looking the part of the administration. But they bound their hands, their feet, even with their headdress on, their coats on. They threw them in. Something that King Nebuchadnezzar could not have ever dreamed took place place he got up and he looked and you do the math with me how many did they throw in how many people were in the fiery furnace how many came out the only time these young men experienced the pre-incarnate jesus christ was in the midst of the fire it says that they were walking they they were thrown in with their hands and their feet bound but they were walking in the midst of the fire and with one who says the image of the sons of god i don't get it i don't understand it the presence of god is with them in the midst of the fire he walks up to the edge of the fire and he yells shadrach meshach a bit to go come out so they walked out in front of all the magistrates in front of all the kings. And they noticed they didn't have bounds on their hands. Their legs were not shackled. Their hair was not singed. Even their coat did not smell like smoke. God delivered them out of the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. In the midst of the fiery furnace, God came and rescued them. So that's our story. But what does that do for us? What is that? How can we apply that? It's a story that took place thousands of years ago, right outside of modern day Baghdad. Wow, that's kind of unique that things like that are taking place during the Bible days. And now Baghdad is right back on the center of the news in 2016. I was wondering, you know, in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23, the king made a decree that look, we're going to take the word of God and we're going to learn these principles. As a nation, we're going to take the word of God and we're going to apply these principles. We're going to take our kids and we're going to make sure that the word of God is applied to their life. I was thinking, if the child back in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23, if they grew up learning, memorizing, studying the scriptures, enough that when they became 20 years old, they didn't have to have the Bible, they knew the principles. They knew the principles within their life. And when they faced the obstacle that the word of God communicated they didn't look at it. They said, I wonder what God thinks about that. I wonder if it's God's will. They said, this is what the Bible says. I don't care what they say. I don't care what my peers say. I care what God says. And they didn't waver from the very principles of God's word. In our society today, 
I ask this one question. Do we know simply, not the word of God, but do we know the principles of God's word? And if I would ask a simple question, and I don't want to embarrass because I probably couldn't do this either. Could you stand up here and give to me the very simplest of questions that I would ask would be, do you know the Ten Commandments? Do you know the Ten Commandments? I know some of them. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt, you know, we know the easy ones. If, if, if we are in a position that our country is taken over and we are faced in bondage and we do not have the word of God within our life, will we have any scripture within our soul, within our mind? Can we hold on to the scripture or will we bow down to anything that comes just to keep us safe? I believe that as Christians, we ought to be just like they were in 2 Kings. We ought to just say, you know what? I want the word of God as principles within my life. I want to learn the scriptures. I want to apply them. I want to live for them. It would be an existence of, it would be a waste of an existence of our faith and in our life if we don't take what God has given to us and apply it to our life. We live a life for self instead of our living our life for God. See, when you put God in the center, everything makes sense. When you take God out of the center of your life, everything's chaotic. When you look at what God is doing within your life and he becomes the focal point, everything is in harmony. Now, the world philosophy would oppose everything that you do. But in your personal space, in your life, when you can synchronize God's will to your desire and the external pressures come in, the external pressures cannot change your internal life as long as God is in the center of it. But when your life is in chaos, when everything seems like it's falling apart, when it seems like the life is throwing you into a fiery furnace, you feel like you're about ready to be destroyed. You feel like there's all kinds of issues going on in your life. You are being cast into that fiery furnace. What do you do? What do you do? See, we all get to that point that we feel like we're going through the flames. It may not be the same thing. It may not be the same situation for every person in this room. But I guarantee you, the furnace of life gets hot. So I just want to give you four principles. First one is persecution. Um, facing the fire deepens our commitment to Christ. When we are persecuted, when you stand up for your faith and they laugh, when you come to church and your family says, if you go to that church, you're not in my family anymore. If you get baptized at that church, you won't be coming home for dinner anymore. If you follow Christ, you won't be in my home anymore. See, persecution comes in a lot of different ways. Persecution, we may think, is whether well, they're laughing at me. Or in Egypt, they're killing me. When we look at what's going on in life, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. When I look at that, I said, that doesn't mean everybody's going to be persecuted. doesn't mean that just because you go to church, you're going to be persecuted. It means, in fact, everyone who wants to live a, what's that, godly life will be persecuted. It's not everybody that just goes to church. Everybody that wants to put God first place within their life, that wants to pick a priority that God loves them, and they love God, you will be persecuted. And the second thing is perseverance. Perseverance. Don't give up into peer, don't give in to peer pressure. Could you imagine the plain of Dura? Thousands of individuals, thousands of individuals, and the harps were playing, the instruments played. All of a sudden, you could see the dust of their knees hitting the ground. And then the dust clears. Three men. Three men alone, standing. There were probably 75 to 80 magistrates that came out of Jerusalem into, Bag into, into Babylon. But only these three men, these three men, stood to peer pressure. See, when we think about peer pressure, we're thinking, well, teenage years or 
high school years or college years. But you know, adults are just as bad as teenagers when it comes to peer pressure. It is, it is. What we must do is we must not be felt into peer pressure. We must understand, I have an internal principle that the peer pressures of life, the principles of life will not change because I have God at my focal point, God at my soul. If I don't have God at my soul, my life is chaotic. I can't let people tell me what to do. I've got to let God tell me what to do. And how he does that is the same way Josiah did it, is the principles of the word of God. And when we know what the principles are, we can live our life to do that. And then we understand the presence. The presence. Um, Jesus will be with you in the fire. If you have your Bibles or up on the screens, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 2 and 3, it says, When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In the midst of the flame, God will walk with you. I like what it says. When you walk through. When you walk through. In the midst of the fire, you name your fire. You name the furnace you're in. You may think, well, it's about a one. Some people may think it's seven. Some, it's so hot I can't handle it. Some people are just playing a little bit with a little bit of fire. But in that fire, in the problems, in the issues of life, that's where God is. There's nothing sweeter and nothing harder that when God gets a hold of us and moves us, and sometimes we put ourselves in that fire because of our ignorance and because of our actions, sometimes God puts us in that fire. You know, because look at this illustration. If they were in 2 Kings and there was a revival in the land, Josiah made a revival and God blessed the country and everything was going good, but God still took these young men out of a revival situation in a country that loved God. God put them out into captivity and put them into the hands of the Babylonians. What, what did we do? What, why am I putting in jail? I didn't do anything. I'm just, I'm just a man that's trying to serve after you, God. Why am I here? I didn't do anything wrong. And in fact, while I'm in here, I'm still going to honor you. When somebody does say something, I am going to say you're the only one and mighty God. I am going to love you. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to proclaim your name. Why am I in prison? Because sometimes God puts you in that situation. So in the midst of all persecution, in every fiery furnace, you can proclaim the name of Christ that those that persecute you, those that put you in place, will know that God is the purpose of your life. And even if everybody else bows, even if everybody falls away, even if everybody curses God, you will stand up and say, my God, my deliverer, I will not bow. What does it take? How can we have that courage? Would we have that courage? But we have to understand, to have that courage, to go through that fire, we have to know that my Lord will rescue me through that fire. We have to know that when I'm about in trouble, when life has fallen apart, when I have no place to go, when I have nowhere to turn, when I feel like I'm destitute and all by myself, when I feel like life is falling apart, my health is gone, my resources are gone, my job is gone, you put your scenario in it. When I fall on my face before God and I try to honor him, he said, I will walk beside you every step of the way. If we don't have God in the center of our life, the internal principles of our life, we will never honor him. We would never do those things. But now, before those times come, we have to put the principles into place. Here's what he does. The last one is our purification. Our purification. God uses the fire to purify you. To purify us. If God didn't heat us up every once in a while, we would never change. Out of the troubling times, God draws us closer to him. And I like what Malachi chapter 3, verse 3 says. He will set a refiner, a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. 
Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings of righteousness. He's going to bring a refiner of silver. He's going to heat us up. He's going to find out the impurities within our life. And what he does as a refiner, he heats that silver up, and the impurities come to the top. And he takes the skimmer, and he takes that impurities up, and he throws it away until the silver is left pure. And that's what God is trying to do with us. That's what he's trying to do with you, and he's trying to do with me. He loves us so much. He wants to use us so much. He wants to, us to be his ve- vehicle, his messenger so much. He wants to get the junk out of our life. So sometimes we're in the fire because of our ignorance. Sometimes we're in the fire because God is trying to work with us. Sometimes we're in the fire because some of our friends are in that fire. Sometimes we're in the fire because we're ignorant about what God really wants. So we walk in a path that we don't ask God anything, so we just do our own thing, and we find ourselves walking outside of God's will. And because we're outside of God's will, the whole world caves in on us. Until we get our hearts lined up with God, until we say, Lord, my life is a mess, until we understand that God wants to walk through that fire with us, he wants to change us, he wants to make, move us, he wants to purify us, until we get to that point, we are going to live a chaotic life. We're going to do the same old, same old all the time. And God has said in here, he said, listen, I'm in the fire. I'm in the furnace. I'll be here for you. I want to walk with you. But listen, until you understand the purpose of your life, you will never magnify my name. But here's what Nebuchadnezzar did after these three boys did this. He came out and he looked at them and they didn't smell like smoke. They didn't have any bonds on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their own bodies and they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god therefore i make a decree that any people nation or language which speaks a thing amiss against god of shadrach meshach and abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses shall be made as ash because there is no other god who can deliver like this that's the testimony That's the testimony. When you have issues, when your life is falling apart, when you feel like you're in the midst of the furnace, you know what you have to do? You have to glorify God. When you get out of the furnace, you have to tell people that God was in the furnace. I've talked to so many people that they're going through major calamities within their life. Maybe they're going through a divorce. Maybe they have financial problems. And they sit down and they say, let me tell you, Bruce. My life was chaotic. But when it came to the point that I didn't know what to do, the sweetest time that I had is when I opened up the scriptures and I was just talking to God. When I was praying, he comforted me. When I needed something to do, he gave to me the peace. He gave to me the wisdom. The sweetest time I had was in the midst of the fire. And you know what? When you have Christ in the midst of your fire and you come out of that fire, you know what it's easy to do? It's easy to worship God. It's easy to understand I'm not coming to church to listen. I'm not coming to church to sing. I'm coming to church to worship. Why am I worshiping? Because my God has delivered me, not only in life, but my sins. I can raise my hands. I can say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with me when I needed you. Thank you for saving me when I couldn't do anything myself. I want to proclaim my Lord, my Savior. I will not have any other gods because no other God can deliver me. I will not bend my knee to any other idol My worship is saved for God. When we go through that furnace, when we go through life, and God walks through that furnace with us, and we walk out, we can say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for rescuing me. And I want to tell everyone, I am not ashamed 
to tell you, my God, my Lord, my Savior is the true God. There's only one way to get to him, and that's through his son, Jesus. I have no shame in telling you, I can't do it alone. I need Christ. When we can do that, we're going to bring glory and honor to his name. People will see what Christ has done for you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A very simple story that we've heard from the time that we were in kindergarten all the way up till now. The principles are the same. I will not bow. The application is the idols that you have in your life, do you allow the idols to control your life or do you allow God to control your life? Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. and Lord, we thank you for a simple Bible verse that means so much. The history behind it and the way that you orchestrated all of that and the way that King Nebuchadnezzar understood that you are the living God. That you are the only one that can deliver people out of the bondage. And you will walk with us in the midst of our problems and our fears. So Lord, we thank you for that. I need you to protect us. Honor us in our life. Allow us, allow us never to bow to anyone or anything other than the one true living God, the God of Israel, the God of my salvation, my Lord, and my Savior. That's our worship, and that's our purpose. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.